Olá pessoal, boa tarde, sejam todos bem-vindos ao turno da tarde do nosso 21º encontro de férias do terceiro dia. E antes de mais nada, eu queria anunciar a ganhadora dos, do prêmio dos nove Hub Readers para o ensino de inglês. Eu espero que ela esteja aqui online, eu ainda não vi se ela está comentando por aqui, eu, eu não vi o nome dela nos comentários, mas eu espero que ela esteja online. Foi a Raquel Roxo. Eu espero que eu tenha falado certo o <risos> seu sobrenome. É, você ganhou os nove readers. A gente vai entrar em contato com você pelo Instagram para pegar todos os seus dados para enviar o seu prêmio, tá bom? Obrigada por ter participado. Obrigada a todo mundo que participou do sorteio. E now uh, to introduce Ricardo Barros. He's going to talk about human connection in virtual classes. Uh, the link for the certificate will be uh, displayed on this video's description during his lecture, okay? You can download it afterwards. And please welcome Ricardo Barros. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, much like most of you, I imagine, I have been teaching online since March last year. Um, I have yet to do uh, any face-to-face -face courses or uh, or lessons in 10 months or however long that uh, it's been. Um, and, and through these uh, these months of teaching online, uh, I have been thinking a lot about uh, the connections that we make and how we can make them, um, even though we're not seeing our students face-to-face -face anymore. Uh, naturally, there are many advantages to teaching online, but there are some challenges as well. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge, uh, or maybe the, the first challenge that teachers may have faced is that of, of loneliness and, and isolation, especially if you used to teach at a school um, where you had the teacher's room, so you'd always see colleagues, uh, chat about work, chat about students, chat about you know, personal life and, and gossip, I suppose. Um, and, and then suddenly you are teaching from your own house, uh, maybe from your living room, from the office in your house, sometimes from your bedroom. Um, and, and you don't have that interaction with your peers and you don't have the interaction with students anymore, right? You don't see, you don't touch uh, the students anymore. So this, this is certainly a big challenge. Uh, the other challenge in that maybe uh, by now has, has been reduced uh, is that technology imposes uh, a learning curve, right? And a steep learning curve in, in some cases. Uh, not every teacher had taught online before the, the pandemic, especially if you were uh, a teacher at a regular school, for instance. And we're suddenly thrown into this world where on top of our teaching skills, we are required to have uh, technology skills, right? And become uh, presenters and YouTubers and edit videos and, and this and that. So there was a, a steep learning curve for, for teachers. Um, another, another important point is that students also had this um, learning curve. And if you're getting new students, be it at the Language Institute or new private students, uh, we're still dealing with, uh, you know, now in January 2021, uh, many months since the pandemic started, still dealing with students that are coming uh, without knowing how to use uh, Zoom or how to use Google Docs or how to use uh, other technologies that we, we have available. So that still presents a challenge to um, our virtual lessons. Uh, this is especially true when you want to um, use different resources, right? Because uh, the question, one of the first questions when we started teaching online was, how can we uh, better simulate or replace the kinds of interactions that we had in face-to-face -face lessons? And in some cases that can be done, right? They can be done to some extent. Uh, we use breakout rooms in Zoom or we use um, Google Jamboard or a plethora of other 
uh, software or websites or apps. But that does put pressure on the students uh, as well as the teachers to be able to juggle all of these things, right? So not only do they have to be able to, to cope with Zoom, but they need to be able to toggle between Zoom and Google Docs and this and that, and now open an app and open a file and, and et cetera. And that can be quite, um, quite difficult for students, especially older, uh, older students, if you uh, have those. Uh, at the very beginning of the, the pandemic and this uh, change to the online teaching, uh, all of the sudden, everybody became a specialist in, in teaching and online teaching in particular. Uh, so there are lots of teachers uh, promoting workshops. And uh, uh, I don't say that negatively, but with, with good intentions, right? Trying to help other teachers. But say, oh, this is the program you should use. This is the software that's going to provide, uh, give you the solutions to, to all the, the problems you have. Um, and we did become inundated with um, all of the, the, the information around uh, teaching online. So we went from, from zero to 100 very quickly, right? Maybe uh, it's not that online teaching didn't exist uh, before March 2020. It certainly did. Um, I, I taught lessons online, I'm sure plenty of people did. But it, it gained uh, uh, importance in a way that it became the topic to be discussed in, in what everything was uh, about and everybody was talking uh, about it. And therefore, too much information uh, for one to, to digest. Um, the last uh, uh, thing to, to consider is that teaching online, not different from teaching face-to-face, -face, is about teaching. Uh, it's about, or I suppose it should be about anyway, it should be about the students. Uh, so it's not, the purpose of our lessons is not to show off uh, how tech savvy we are. It's not to show off a new program, a new software, a new app, or anything like that. So our purpose in, in the case of English teachers uh, is to make our students better speakers of, of English, better users um, of the language. So once, once the CELTA started, because of the pandemic, uh, when it's, it became online, that's one of the things that I kept telling my, uh, my candidates, my CELTEs, which is some of you know a lot about technology, some of you don't know much, but uh, using technology is not a requirement of the CELTA and it's not a requirement uh, for you to be a teacher either. Uh, what I expect you to do uh, is to provide students uh, uh, you know, with content, with ideas, with materials, with activities that are going to make them uh, uh, better speakers, that are going to improve their grammar, their reading skills, and et cetera. And there are multiple ways uh, uh, to do that. Uh, you may be able to do that by sharing you know, your Word document with students the same way uh, you might be able to do that using uh, uh, lots of bells and whistles. But uh, we shouldn't be distracted of our goal, and our goal is to help students uh, become better speakers of, of English. Right. So there are some uh, good questions in the chat, and uh, Barbara is going to uh, collect them for me, and we're going to address them uh, towards the end, because it's difficult for me to keep up with the, the questions, but do keep the questions coming and, and we'll talk about them at the end. So uh, I was reading uh, this, this research by White and she identified uh, four key pedagogical uh, themes or, or elements that emerged from her research into online teaching. So uh, four things that are important uh, in the realm of online teaching. Course development, course evaluation, teaching roles, and learner support. And it's uh, the latter two that I want to, to teach on because they are particularly important, um, especially uh, in this context of teaching private students, teaching one-to-one, -one, moving to 
the, the online um, environment. So uh, some of the teaching roles uh, that existed in face-to-face -face lessons still apply to online lessons, but they have been exacerbated that they become more important. And I think one of them is that the teacher as a psychologist, um, especially for those that teach one-to-one, -one, there, are, there are lots of moments um, in our lessons where we have to become the psychologists in, in, in the way, and I mean informally, of course, uh, you shouldn't be giving you know, life advice maybe to, to people as if you were a psychologist, right? Unless you were trained for that. But where students uh, uh, tell us about their lives and tell us, tell us about their worries, about their problems and et cetera. And because of uh, the pandemic, I think that became more common and more prominent in, in lessons, especially in one-to-one -one lessons. Uh, because lots of students maybe uh, lost their jobs, right, or had uh, problems in their relationships, much like teachers uh, did. And, and then these things uh, uh, were brought to our, our lessons. So the, the things to consider, I think, are naturally uh, uh, the student's personal life is important in, in our lessons. So uh, what their job, their interests, uh, their, what their family is like. And we always bring these elements to class, right? We want students to talk about things that are meaningful uh, to them. But we need to be careful um, not to let our lessons become, uh, uh, you know, just a, a, a space for the student to vent. Because what usually uh, happens is they're going to, to vent uh, uh, and then use the class time for that. And then towards the end of the semester, the end of the month, the end of the course, whatever kind of deadline uh, you're working with, they're going to complain. But, oh, Ricardo, I don't think I learned as much this semester. And then you think, oh, no wonder, because you just you know, vented about your problems. So we, we need to draw the line or at least show students, look, um, I, I don't mind uh, uh, this, but you need to be aware that we're uh, uh, doing this instead of uh, uh, maybe working on, on uh, other skills in your English. So make the students aware that this is what's happening um, and, and whether they really want to spend your, uh, uh, your, your t class time together doing that. Um, and then if they do, maybe you should charge more because my psychologist charges more for our sessions than I do for my, for my lessons. So keep that in mind. Um, another, another interesting uh, uh, fact is th this word uh, is not a word that I'm very fond of. This uh, word that teacher as a facilitator I think that's overused um, a little bit in ELT. But the, the thing to consider when we move to the online environment is that now uh, uh, the, literally the world uh, is our oyster. So we have access to all kinds of information and, and access to uh, loads of resources and tools. So much more than, than in the classroom, although many classrooms already had the internet and interactive whiteboards and students uh, have had mobile phones for a while, but now everybody's connected and is online while we're having the lessons. So the teacher uh, can become this facilitator or this manager of information in, in helping students find information and guiding them uh, uh, through the information. So uh, it's, it's more important than ever that we're using um, inductive approaches to teaching, that we're letting students figure things out, that we're posing questions that are going to uh, get students to reflect uh, and then showing them how to find answers uh, uh, and then kind of guiding them to uh, uh, finding things out about the language and then putting them in situations to uh, use the language. That is uh, uh, what I have in mind when I say the, the teacher should play the role of, of facilitators. So how can we use uh, all of the information that is available online to us uh, in our favor and let the, the students do the hard work. So the, the hard work of the teacher should come before the lesson. When you are uh, thinking about the content of your lesson, you're thinking about the resources you're going to use, 
uh, you're thinking about the, the stages, uh, you're thinking about how making that content, how you can make that content useful or meaningful to your students and etc. But once we are in the lesson, um, what you should be doing is taking a step back uh, and letting the students do the hard work. So let the students do the talking, and that means naturally uh, controlling your uh, uh, how much you're talking, how much you're participating, because uh, your English is good enough, right? You're not the one uh, whose English needs to be uh, improved. And, and letting the students do the, uh, the talking, the figuring out, the working out of, of information and, and etc. cetera. Uh, another key point, I would say, is investing in relationships. And just because uh, we're now online, our relationships are not much different. I like this uh, quote from, from Paulo Dantas. This is from a talk he gave at, at Troika. And he says, uh, Momento fez com que transformássemos o encontro presencial em um encontro virtual. Mas ainda é um encontro. Uh, so for those that don't speak Portuguese in the audience, he's saying, uh, the, these classes are online gatherings, but they're still a gathering where people are together and they should be treated as such. Uh, so maybe before um, you made small talk uh, before the lesson started uh, with students and asked about their lives, and why can't you do that now? Uh, we are inside the, the students' uh, homes and there are pros and cons to that, but we need to uh, use that in our favor. So what do students have access to in their houses that they don't have access to when they are in a classroom at a school or uh, in their offices? So maybe they have more access to uh, personal objects. So how can you include these personal objects in your lessons? Uh, they may have access to uh, photos or, or other things. How can you make those things part of, of the lesson to create a relationship with students? Um, all of this may require that you open the door uh, uh, you know, to, to your house, to students as well. And in this case, I don't mean literally open the door, of course, but um, opening the, uh, uh, you know, the door to your personal life. So what things that you do have at home that you can share with students now uh, that you can show students and encourage them to, to do the same. So uh, how can you personalize the lessons? Or how can you make things feel as if uh, uh, you're sharing th your life with students to make everything more, more engaging? And to give you an example, uh, just this week I was observing a, a lesson, a CELTA lesson, and there was a lesson about Sean. So Sean is a Canadian, uh, and it was a, uh, a lesson about be able to and can and could for abilities. So there is a, a very engaging uh, uh, intro by the, the teacher. And then you had this listening about Sean, uh, who is this nameless, bodiless person uh, that has a Canadian, ac a Canadian accent in him explaining uh, about things that he can do and he can do. Um, and what we discussed during feedback was, how can we transform this uh, John Doe from the course book into somebody that is more meaningful to students? So if Sean becomes, I don't know, uh, uh, rather than a nameless person in the book, but you can say, oh, Sean is a friend of mine. Uh, Sean is an English teacher as well, right? Uh, either I worked with Sean here in Brazil or I met Sean, Sean when I went to Canada. Uh, and then the, the things that Sean are ta uh, Sean's talking about, his abilities, they suddenly become more, more meaningful. So by adding this element, sometimes invented, or sometimes by replacing uh, a listening where uh, uh, whoever recorded Sean's voice talking about their abilities, you instead create your own uh, uh, listen, your own story where you say uh, what your abilities are and what your inabilities are. So if you're sharing uh, uh, with students, oh, I'm good at this, but there are things that I'm not good at. Right? So I, I'm able to do this, but there are things that I'm awful at. 
that I'm not able to do. Uh, students are more likely to invest in the relationship and then open up about uh, um, open up about their abilities as well. And I think that makes a, a big difference. Uh, so to, to wrap up this uh, this bit, uh, uh, it's exactly about adapting materials or creating materials that we're going to, to establish this connection with um, with students. So it doesn't matter if you use a course book or not, uh, and I don't want to get into the uh, uh, the argument in whether course books are, are good or evil and whether you should use them or use only authentic materials or use a mix. Uh, I think that's for each teacher to, to decide uh, if you have the, the decision power, right? Because depending on where you work, uh, you may not be able to, to decide that. But uh, it's our responsibility to adapt that material, whatever it is, authentic or non-authentic, to cater for our students' needs, to make uh, lessons interesting for them. And especially when it comes to developing these relationships, uh, uh, to share our uh, uh, personal experience and our personal stories and our personal lives with students so that uh, they can do the same and we connect uh, even if we're not seeing the students, if we, if we are uh, far away from, from the students, right? Sometimes uh, students are in other cities, in other states, even in other countries, but you're able to establish connections if you uh, uh, open, this, um, open this door to to our students. Uh, now, I think this is uh, maybe obvious um, that we should show our faces to students uh, and we have a camera. Um, but very recently, my, my wife was telling me, that my wife is also a teacher, she works in a regular school, and they have this training um, where somebody who is not from the, the teaching world uh, gives, them, uh, uh, gives them a training session on some software that the school is, is uh, adopting. And that the person who gives the training doesn't use a camera. I, I'm not sure if she doesn't have one, if she doesn't want to turn the camera on. Uh, I don't know what her deal is. But can you imagine uh, having hours of training um, with this, this voice from, you know, from beyond? This this bodiless kind of, of voice, it's it's awful. And I know that uh, the other way around, we should incentivize students to, to use their cameras as well. Depending on your teaching context, that may be difficult. I know that teenagers uh, uh, haven't been the most, the most forthcoming when it comes to uh, using cameras. There are activities um, that you can do. Uh, Thiago Barbieri, who, who is here in the chat today, uh, Thiago, post your, uh, your Instagram in the chat. Uh, he's often posting ideas uh, to be used in online lessons and has some interesting ideas to try to encourage students um, to, to use their cameras in class. But uh, uh, if you're dealing with adults uh, and if you're having one-to-one -one lessons, uh, it's, it's paramount right, that both you and your students um, are having their camera on because otherwise, otherwise it's going to be very difficult to, to have that connection. Um, with, with students. So we talked about uh, the roles of, of the teacher, um, but there's all, I'd also like to mention the, uh, the learner support. When uh, um, we, we, back when I was uh, teaching in a, in a language institute, um, the kinds of technology difficulties my students had were things like, oh, the, the DVD from my uh, my course book doesn't work, or uh, oh, how how can I access the extra activities that the school has online? And those they either were easy to solve, or uh, I would ask them to talk to the IT person. Um, I was lucky enough to work at a school where there was an IT person, so it wasn't really much of my concern uh, the kinds of technology problems that my students had. But that's not the case anymore, because when we, we uh, move to online lessons, uh, the technology problems become part of our day-to-day uh, uh, -day teaching, right? And then directly interfere with our teaching. 
Uh, the first thing to consider is, oh, I, I found this new app or this new site or this new software uh, that is perfect for what I want to do. But does it work on all the devices that my students have? Um, in the CELTA, for instance, we, we deal with volunteer students and they're all adults. And we ask them to have access to uh, a computer, so either a desktop or a laptop, to have headphones with a microphone. And we ask them, you know, all of these things uh, help or help reduce the, the number of problems that students may have. We ask them to uh, use a, a wired connection to the internet rather than Wi Fi because that's those tend to be more stable. But sometimes, um, they access the, the lessons using their mobile phones. Sometimes they use their tablets. Sometimes uh, they use their computer, but they don't have a headphone. Uh, and then all of these things uh, come into play during the, uh, the lesson. So uh, especially because of, of the pandemic, we can't assume that the students who have access to their computers, even if they do own a computer, because uh, what about their uh, husbands and wives that also have online lessons or that have online meetings at work? What about their children that also have online classes, be them classes at school, be them English classes, or uh, loads of other things that children do? So it, it's certainly uh, uh, if devices were already at a premium inside a house, uh, with more than one, one person leaving them, uh, that became much more so um, at the beginning of the pandemic. For instance, uh, my, my wife had a really old laptop that wasn't meant to, to be used heavily and in online lessons. Um, and we started sharing my, my laptop. So uh, when I was teaching, uh, uh, she used my laptop. And then when I wasn't teaching, she, uh, sorry, when I was teaching, I used it. And then she, when she wasn't teaching, uh, man, I got this wrong. So we shared it. Uh, she and, and I were using the same laptop. Um, and then we took turns, depending on how important, if sometimes we had to teach at the same time. And one of us stayed in the office, which is this room that you can see behind me. And one of us uh, taught in the living room because uh, although our apartment's not small, uh, it was not uh, uh, bought or, or thought of as a place where both of us would have to work at the same time. And uh, in the living room, we have a, a young son. Uh, some of you may, may know my son. Uh, so if you teach in the living room, that means teaching uh, with my son behind us or around us. And my son loves computers and loves keyboards because he's learning how to uh, identify letters and he's learning the alphabet. So he wants to uh, participate in things. Uh, and, and that's coming from a perspective of somebody who is very lucky to uh, have more than one computer and being able to have two rooms inside the house where it can work in silence and etc. So consider the kinds of things uh, you may need to, to teach your students. So uh, maybe they are able to use Google Docs or Jamboard or other uh, softwares or apps when they are on the PC. But what if uh, uh, they're using their mobile to access the lesson? Uh, you, you need to give them support or you need to have a plan B. So what can I do uh, to have all of my students participating in the class, even if they're using different devices, if some of the, their devices uh, don't work? Uh, for instance, one of our volunteers at the CELTA, uh, Intensive CELTA in January, is a young woman, I think she's in the early 30s. Um, and she seems to be very tech savvy, but she accesses, she uses uh, her mobile phone to go to classes. And she says, oh, I can't download things to my phone, handouts or PDFs or whatever apps that you want me to use because my, uh, uh, my storage is full. And, and what can you tell her? Buy a, a new mobile phone, right? It's not uh, uh, our, our role to tell her that. Uh, no, nor to tell her to delete things from her phone. So we need to find ways uh, to include her in the lesson, to give her support, to make sure that she's participating, even if she uh, uh, has these kinds of, of device problems. Um, another important thing 
uh, to consider is money in this in this regard, and this has to do with the support uh, to students. Many of our students uh, may have lost their jobs, and, and maybe in some cases they, they may a student may have come to you and said, "Oh, uh, I'd like I, I can't have classes anymore, and um, I am going to." Uh, you know, take take some time off studying because I can't afford it, and etc. Uh, I'm I'm lucky enough that only one of my students lost her job. All of my students, um, when it comes to one-to-one -one teaching or teaching groups, are teachers, and luckily only one of them lost their, their jobs. Um, and this particular student was preparing for the CPE, and I, I said, "Look, uh, keep doing the lessons without paying me." So she's having classes in a in a group, which is not a one-to-one. -one lesson and once you get a job again and you are financially stable you, you resume paying me now i'm not saying that this is the kind of thing uh, uh you need to be doing to all of your students so this is a student that uh she had been my SOT before we, we have a, a relationship she had been my student for uh, a little while so i knew her and, and i thought i was able to afford the losses because really it was a small group and her not doing the classes or doing the classes without paying we wouldn't change my life whatsoever. I'd still need to be online at that time, I still need to prepare the lessons and et cetera. But uh, uh, if you're not able to do that, at least consider uh, in these difficult times in these online lessons, uh, do I need to ask my students to buy a new book or can I make do uh, uh, with the old book they have? or maybe I can make do with online materials or materials that are available for free on websites for teachers uh, or blogs for teachers and et cetera. So uh, uh, how can I make easier for my students to keep having English lessons uh, and keep paying you as well, right? Because uh, we, we, I'm sure most of you love teaching. I love teaching, I love English, but uh, I work because I need money, right? I want to uh, buy, books in English so I can read them. I want to buy, pay Netflix so I can enjoy uh, uh, the little pleasures in life. I'll say travel, but it doesn't seem like Brazilians will be able to travel anytime soon. So uh, might as well not mention that. Um, anyway, so how can you help your students in terms of money uh, to make their, their lives easier and, and uh, uh, make sure that you're going to keep these students for a long time naturally? Uh, uh, the student that I'm talking about was very grateful. Then some months later, she, she had got a new job. It got uh, stable and she resumed paying me and uh, I was happy I was able to, uh, to do that. So consider uh, the price of the, the course book that you're adopting as well, uh, of the materials and whether those things are necessary for you to teach uh, uh, your, your students under these, uh, these times. Another, another huge consideration is uh, the time of the, uh, the times of, of the lesson. Uh, I used to teach, I don't know, 90 minute lessons face to face. And is it the same? So should I still be teaching 90 minute lessons uh, when I move to this online environment? Uh, how does the time of the lesson connect to the, the environment that we have. And I think it, it really depends on how many students you have in, in your class. But if you had long lessons, uh, I would consider possibly reducing them, both for, for Shin's sake, but also for your sake. Uh, for, for me, being in front of the computer and sitting down uh, for hours on end uh, really puts a toll on my, on my body. And, that may have to do with my advanced age, I turned 40 this, uh, this year. But uh, uh, having a break in between lessons, being able to, to stand up and stretch uh, becomes even more um, important. And keeping the engagement of the students for long stretches uh, is different in, in the online environment. So uh, a lot of, of my last, a lot of the lessons that I teach online that are one to one are, are one hour, and I think one hour uh, should be fine. But be mindful of 90 minutes or uh, two hour long lessons in whether the students are fully engaged up until the end 
uh, of the lesson, especially if those are evening lessons and everybody is, uh, is tired. So uh, all of these, these challenges uh, kind of create a barrier maybe between uh, the teacher and the students. So uh, I have five kind of keys, let's call them, to, to open the gates, to unlock these doors so we can uh, uh, better connect, right? Find this, this human connection uh, with our students in our uh, virtual world, the world of, of online lessons. So uh, first is connect with the students and say, oh my God, that's uh, easier, uh, easier said than done, right? Uh, thanks for coming to my, my TED talk. That's the, the brilliant advice I have, uh, I have for you. But what I, what I mean uh, to say is, uh, this is, is some research from uh, online conferences for teachers by Moore Fisher and Baber, Baber, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, uh, in that teachers that participate in online conferences uh, they really value interaction with other participants. What does that mean to our online lessons? Uh, are you replacing the, the pair work, group work, uh, the kind of interactive activities you had in your face-to-face -face lessons with anything that is remotely similar uh, to this, uh, in this online environment? So I mentioned earlier, I'm sure uh, you're familiar, Zoom has uh, breakout rooms, which is a wonderful tool. Uh, it's very easy uh, uh, to put students into pairs and trios and groups. It's a matter of a couple of, of clicks. And uh, whenever I, I have workshops for teachers, for instance, uh, I try very hard to think, how can I have these moments where, where teachers are going to be put in breakout rooms and there are tasks for them to perform uh, they're going to take an active role in, in learning, but also where they're going to simply interact with other teachers uh, and share their experiences and say, oh, I'm having these problems, uh, but there's another teacher that's also having this, these problems. And maybe we can uh, uh, think about it together and, and figure out uh, a solution. Or you identify with somebody else and maybe you become friends. So these, these interactions, uh, are as important as they are as, as you know, the actual things we, we do in, in workshops. So if you, for some reason, uh, don't use Zoom for your lessons, I know lots of schools are, are Google schools and they use Google Hangouts, um, but it's important to consider, even if less frequently, because they're going to take longer to set up in, in other, um, let's say, environments, um, but consider ways in which you can give students these moments of, of interaction um, where they are still doing the kinds of things they would do, uh, talking together, uh, uh, planning things, uh, uh, having fun, you know, doing, doing activities the same way they would in face-to-face in -face class. I think that's what the, the connection is about. And we also, uh, when you talk about the connection, this also has to do with uh, um, establishing uh, uh, establishing that that personalization that we mentioned earlier, especially if you uh, teach one to one. Another consideration: if you teach one to one, and then the breakout rooms are meaningless, right? Because you're not going to put people by themselves in their breakout rooms. Is how can you change uh, the patterns of interaction in the lesson so that it's not always teacher and student. And I, I, what I mean is, it's always going to be one-to-one, -one, right? Because uh, there are only two people in the class. But uh, if you're always the teacher and the other person is always the student, there are hierarchy in this relationship. So maybe sometimes the student can be the boss and you can be the employee. Uh, the student can be a parent and you play the role of a child. Uh, so sometimes you're going to be co-workers and then you are uh, at the same hierarchical, hierarchical level. I think. Changing the roles uh, will help you add variety and connect with students. So it's not always you kind of looking down because you're the person who knows more about English uh, than the student does. Um, and, and that, I think, will allow you to open up this variety of, of tasks, even if uh, it's a one-to-one -one lesson. 
So uh, how can I have different roles? And then not only have discussions as you might have in a one-to-one, -one. I ask the question, my student answers the, the questions, but uh, what, what other tasks can I uh, come up with? Uh, so maybe the students are going to ask me the questions. Uh, maybe there's going to be some brainstorming, some listing, some ranking, and not only discussion, which although important is, is overused, especially in one-to-one uh, -one lessons. Uh, it's important to remember that our students are not robots, and that if you're always doing the same things, our students get tired. So uh, I, for instance, love using guided discovery in grammar and vocabulary lessons. But if every grammar and vocabulary lesson uses guided discovery, how fun is that going to be for a student after a semester or, God forbid, after a whole year of only doing guided discovery every other week in their, in their lessons? So uh, much like in real life, I suppose variety is the, the spice of life. Uh, there's no need to set off fireworks. So forget, I mentioned earlier, the bells and whistles. Uh, you don't need to, to use the most uh, uh, innovative technology, brand new thing for your lessons to work. Uh, so focus on the content, focus on the students more than on setting fireworks. And if you do decide to use uh, new software, new programs, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but if you do, make sure that you know how it works and that you test it before using, because you're going to uh, uh, need to give support to students. Uh, and if you don't know yourself how to use the program, how can you expect the students to, uh, to do so? I think that would be um, unfair. Um, I think this, this is not maybe the most uh, uh, supportive statement, but there are no magic solutions, right? Uh, there is not one program or software that's going to uh, do the work for you. So regardless of whether you're teaching online or face-to-face, -face, and I'm sure you know this, uh, teachers work a lot, but you still need to do all those, uh, uh, all the preparation, all, all the hard work before the lesson, so the lesson works. And finally, uh, technology fails, right? Uh, if your internet connection is down, there may not much for you to do uh, besides calling you know, your internet provider and complaining. But uh, uh, technology you know, fails, uh, shit happens. And it's important that both you and the student or students uh, are aware of that. Um, so again, I was very lucky not to have to too many problems with technology this, this year, but I, I can remember at least a couple of lessons where I, I had to stop halfway through because my, my internet connection either uh, uh, was down or uh, was so bad, so unstable that I, I, I told myself, look, let's uh, stop and, and we spend more time on it next, uh, next week. So uh, as long as if you're honest about students, uh, I think everybody will be, will be happier in the end. Uh, so we should have about six minutes for, uh, for questions. I'm going to look at the uh, questions that Barbara had for me, and hopefully I can address those. All right, Barbara, do you have any, any questions to share with me in the... Uh, oh, hi, Ricardo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'll go through the from the start of the, the lecture. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Leila Souza has commented that some of my students didn't adapt to Zoom or Weebly, and I had to try Jits, Jits, uh, Jitsi Meets, I'm sorry. All of them are okay, but we have our favorite interface, and it sometimes is not the same our students like. Oh, that's a great point, yeah. Uh, just because, uh, uh, for instance, I, I'm a Zoom user, um, I, I don't understand why schools use Google Meet instead of Zoom. I think it's simply an inferior tool for teaching. But that's that's my personal opinion. Uh, it doesn't mean that students feel the same, um, and it doesn't mean it's going to work for all the, the students. For instance, back when I started teaching um, online, uh, I used to use Skype. But in some cases, because students had computers from their companies, and their companies had you know, 
firewalls and they couldn't uh, use Skype for whatever reason. And then we had to try uh, alternative uh, uh, softwares. I think being open to, to that is a good sign. Um, it may be tough for the teacher if you have to plan and, and use different softwares. Uh, but I think that's, that's the right move if you want to keep the, the students. Sometimes requiring students to download things or to create logins and create accounts uh, is too much for some students. So using a platform uh, that's maybe easier uh, and simpler, maybe doesn't have as many resources, is better than having one that's so fancy, that's super fancy, but that doesn't offer the same kinds. Uh, but that's more difficult for the students to, to log on to. Uh, what else, Bobby? Uh, Henry Akashi asks, uh, Ricardo, do you think online teaching and one-on-one -on -one teaching will become more relevant in CELTAS courses? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, we don't know how long the courses are going to be allowed to be done online. Um, if I had to bet, I think Cambridge is going to come to the realization that um, the, the online sellers work well and that Cambridge makes more money out of them. And then it will become the, the norm. Because uh, really, it's been so great, uh, although I miss the face-to-face -face connection with people, uh, to have people from all over Brazil in, in Celtas here in Sao Paulo, and then people uh, telling me, oh, I'm so glad that I didn't have to come all the way from Manaus to Sao Paulo and spend uh, you know, more than a thousand reais in plane tickets and etc. to do this course. Uh, so I, I think they'll become more, more important and have a more, uh, uh, become a bigger part of, of the course. Uh, but even before the pandemic started, the last face-to-face -face course I, I ran, which was in January of 2020, uh, we had a session on, on online teaching. Uh, we actually uh, uh, kind of used Zoom and we had teachers in different rooms inside the school. Uh, and then we, we talked to a former CLT that had, uh, some of you may know, Isabel Badre, uh, that she has a very successful uh, Instagram account. And she talked to all the, the, the CLTs in the course. And the purpose was both to show them uh, uh, the, the Zoom environment, but also uh, uh, to, to you know, talk about things that are relevant to one-to-one -one teachers, such as having an Instagram account and, and etc. Uh, so that became even more important after the, the pandemic hit. Uh, I think it will become uh, a bigger part of course, such as South and other courses in, in general. Uh, what else, Bobby? Uh Tiago M. asked, M, I'm sorry, asked, have you noticed how some students change their persona when they're online? It's as if the change of context changes the person's behavior. Um, that's a deep question, right? Uh, I'm going to put on my psychologist role. Uh, I think so. Um, and, and to use a non-online um, example, uh, this is something that I have discussed with my psychologist and many, many colleagues as well. I think I have a different personality when I'm speaking English than I have when I'm speaking Portuguese. So just having the, the English kind of uh, uh, mask makes me a different person. And I think that's also true when you are online. Um, and maybe the, the trolls of, of internet forums are an example of that, right? People do change uh, personalities. And whether that's good or bad, I think it depends, but I think that's, uh, uh, that's true. Uh, I have to agree with, with that. Uh, Weber Mota, I hope I said it right this time, uh, he's asking, but don't you think this non-human communication is making our students too virtual? Too virtual? Are, they too, uh, are there too many tools for communication to be accepted in a simple way? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Um, and hopefully what you take out of this talk is uh, that using uh, a lot of resources shouldn't be the point of our lessons. So uh, I have heard of teachers uh, teaching using WhatsApp, the WhatsApp video uh, tool, right? Like video calls. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's two teachers that use Skype. So the, the platform, the software, the, the interface is not what matters really. Um, as long as you can hear 
and hopefully see the students, um, I'm sure you can uh, you can teach English. Uh, so focusing more on the content, focusing more on what's important to the student, what's meaningful, can help reduce this virtualness, if that's a word, of our relationships uh, with students. And I think the more softwares, apps, etc., you you are implementing, uh, the more barriers you are uh, uh, putting in between you and the students. So uh, my, my advice would be uh, maybe th that's a little counterintuitive, but less technology and more people in, in online lessons. I think that's uh, what's important. How are we doing for time, Barbara? Can you do one more? Yeah, we have time for two short questions. Okay. Uh, Henry Akashi asked again, uh, how much would we engage with our students on social media, like Instagram stories? Mm -hmm. How much do you consider it's healthy? Uh, that's a great question, Henry. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I have the, the right answer. Um, I personally like to have, I, I have two Instagram accounts or I suppose three if I'm being totally honest, but I have a personal account uh, that is locked or closed or whatever you call those, because that's where I post photos of my son, photos of my family, and where I complain about the government. Uh, and that's a completely separate account from my professional account, um, which is uh, uh, for teachers. And I very much like interacting with teachers on my Instagram account. Um, and if you are a student, if you are a teacher that deals with, with regular students, right, known teacher students, I would imagine it's the, the same. Uh, but I'm not going to say that if a person doesn't like uh, uh, to interact with students, they're, they're wrong because uh, uh, you know their private lives uh, are their private lives. So I think it's generally better to separate your accounts uh, although that often means people end up not only using one account and not having a professional or not having a personal account because it's a lot of work having more than uh, than one account. Uh, because unless you are a, a, I don't know, a huge personality, uh, I think sharing too much of your personal life may not be the best. But again, it's my personal opinion. It's up, up to each teacher. Uh, but if to answer your question, I like interacting with my students who are teachers on social media. Um, I value that very much. And the last question is from Familia Balta Souza. Uh, I don't know if he, if it is a he or a she, but uh, it's asking how much knowledge of technology a teacher should master in order to deal with young students. Um, I think whew, uh, young students are not uh, my area of expertise, first of all. I haven't taught uh, young learners in a very long time. Um, but the experience of, of uh, seeing my son, my son is three and a half, have online lessons and uh, uh, participating with him in some online lessons. Um, I don't think the teacher needs more expertise in technology per se. I just think they need, uh, uh, much like I suppose uh, um, teachers of young learners need tools to engage the students because their attention span span is much shorter than that of adolescents or, or adults. So the my, my son had English, uh, not only English, had lessons with at least four or five different teachers. So his regular teacher, the English teacher, the physical education teacher, the music teacher, and this and that. And the most successful ones uh, from the point of view of a parent were the ones that uh, had lots of little tasks for them to do, lots of different things. And then he was always engaged. Um, and sometimes when they tried having activities that were too long, uh, my son lost interest and stopped paying attention to his toys or, or other things. So that's my uneducated view of teaching young learners online. That, uh, uh, it's not about the technology again, but it's about interacting with your target audience, in this case, young children, and, and considering what makes them different from teenagers and, and adults. Uh, and that's it. And, and that's it. Uh, we.
we got all our time. I want to thank everybody that joined us through this talk today. Thanks a lot, everybody. And thanks a lot, Ricardo, for uh, giving us some of your time to to uh, share your knowledge with us. You're very welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Hope to see you guys uh, right to our next lecture, which will be presented by Lilian Leventhal, talking about uh, Gen Alpha or iGen, the super connected kids. Okay, I will see you guys soon on our next lecture. Hope you have enjoyed it. And Thank thanks a lot again. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you.